Welcome, everyone. Greetings and thanks for joining us at the New School today. I am Kara Epstein, the program coordinator of the New School of Commonweal. And today we are welcoming astrologer, two astrologers, um, astrologer and intuitive Rachel Lang and astrologer, psychotherapist and Jungian analyst Yvonne Smith-Tarnas with our host, Michael Lerner. We are recording this conversation. You can find all of our recordings on SoundCloud, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, as well as our website. I want to thank Ken Adams, who always is behind the scenes helping us with production. I think that's all of my housekeeping to do. So I will turn it over to Michael Lerner and welcome you all to the new School of Commonweal. Thank you, Kara. Mm -hmm. uh, a delight to be here with Yvonne Tarnas and Rachel Lang and to uh, talk about uh, astrology and Jungian psychology and where these two great archetypal systems meet. Uh, I'll introduce both of my colleagues briefly. Yvonne Tarnas uh, is a PhD and a marriage and family therapist, astrologer, psychotherapist, Jungian analyst. Uh, besides her consulting practice, she's a clinical supervisor and instructor for the San Francisco Jung Institute and lectures on psychology and astrology. She's written a number of very significant things and, uh, and lectures around the world. Uh, Rachel Lang, a friend and colleague with whom I've done a number of new school conversations, is a professional astrologer, psychic medium, and the author of Modern Day Magic and Simple Rules to Realize Your Power and Shape Your Life. Uh, she teaches courses like Astrology for Creatives, Working with Magics, and Relationships in Astrology. And uh, she uh, has an astrology column uh, and uh, does many other uh, wonderful things. Um, and uh, just to start with, um, Rachel and Yvonne, um, Let's just start at the very beginning um, with the astrological weather for today. Um, Yvonne, when you got up in the morning and thought about doing this conversation and you looked at the astrological weather for today, uh, what does the weather look like for this conversation? I thought it looked pretty good, actually. And so I was excited. I well, tell us about it. What when you say it looked pretty good? What? Well, what? I, I focused actually, to be honest, Michael, on how the planets were going to be touching my personal planets, so that I knew I was going to be okay. <laughs> so, and what made you feel that you were going to be okay? Um, the moon was going to be in a positive aspect to my sun, so that that would be an emotional kind of. Uh, support to my sense of self. And that that's one of the first things that one might want to look at in terms of going into a new situation is how are they being supported emotionally? How are they going to be, you know, held in, in some frame in the experience you're about to enter? Mm -hmm. So wonderful. Yeah. Rachel, as you woke up today and thought about this conversation, uh, what did you check? What or what was on your mind uh, on the astrology for today? Mm -hmm. Well, the, there are a couple of things that, are, that were on my mind. The first one being that we are just about eight days out from an eclipse. So the eclipse happening on April 30th. And so that means technically we are in this window of time where things intensify. Um, the, uh, there's a, a real nice balance between the element of earth and the element of water. We have the moon in Capricorn. And like Yvonne was saying, wherever the moon is, that's, that's sort of the mood and the vibe of what we are all feeling and what we're all tuned into and synced up with. And that moon in Capricorn is 
is really thoughtful. It is really practical. And so, um, and so, you know, that combined with this eclipse energy, which eclipses bring up to the surface that which we need to look at, which we need to explore. It's like we can access hidden truth um, and find really practical ways to, uh, to allow changes to happen in our lives as a result. Hmm. So um, that's the some of the weather for today. Um, and now let's start by looking out at the world for a moment. Uh, the world seems to be in a particularly chaotic mood these days. Um, I do a lot of thinking about what we call the global poly crisis, the kind of interacting uh, global stressors, environmental, social, technological, financial. And in uh, the way I think about it, we have three great poster ch children for the, the poly crisis right now. We have the climate emergency, we have the COVID pandemic, we have um, the war in the Ukraine. There are many, many other events, but the world is looking particularly chaotic to many of us right now. Uh, Rachel, starting with you, um, what's going on? How do you understand, uh, especially what's happening in the Ukraine, but the general chaos uh, with which we're living right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's multi-layered. And in prepping for our conversation today, I went back to the last time Pluto was in late degrees of Capricorn, which is where it is right now. Pluto um, signifies a big transformation. So a lot of the, the systemic changes that we're going through, a lot of the, it's the planet of death and rebirth. And so a lot of times when we're talking about upheaval or we're talking about the ways in which we're reinventing or recreating um, society, we're looking at Pluto. And, and so uh, the last time Pluto, Pluto takes 248 years to make one full uh, rotation around the sun. And the last time Pluto was in late degrees of Capricorn, we were in the American Revolution. Mm. And, and the inflation rates that, that um, of this country, because everyone's talking about inflation right now, the inflation rates uh, at that time uh, were higher than they've ever been before. Mm. So we're seeing similar themes. And one of the big themes we saw back then was um, all about taxation without representation. It was about the, the income inequality, the injustice within our economic systems. And so these are themes that we're seeing right now too. Um, when we look back, and this is one great thing about astrology is that these cycles repeat themselves. So you can look back and see what was happening at that time. Are there similar astrological signatures to what's happening today? And one of the other big cycles that we have going on right now, it involves the planet Uranus. So Uranus is the planet of technological innovation. It's the planet of change and, and rebellion. And so when we see Pluto and Uranus in a spectral relationship with one another, we tend to see big revolutionary change. And then, and, um, and so we're seeing similar themes right now that we saw both in the 1940s, the 1700s, the 1960s. There's a lot of what I'm seeing as, as um, sort of a, a breakdown of the systems that no longer serve the whole and a move toward a more collective approach toward um, toward more equality um and uh and I, I could take the entire hour talking about these cycles but i want to give yvonne a, a chance to talk as well thank you and yvonne what would you add to that you know i, I would agree with rachel i would also add 
um, you know, we want to bring in the the other archetypal energies that are aspecting that Pluto because that's where it adds a kind of signature of, of a sorts. And we've got that Uranus square Pluto that's been going on since around 2007 to 2020. So that takes us up into the beginning of the pandemic. And that's, you know, there's, there's sort of a collective nature of change afoot. It's not always in the surface. It's underground. Pluto doesn't always reveal itself uh, right away. It, it, it moves underneath the surfaces in the psychological perimeter which is very much about what Pluto kind of carries psychologically. Um, so that coincided too, as Saturn came in in 2018 and began with its sort of ongoing, um, what we call a conjunction that's coming into close aspect with Pluto, which um, brings in that force of, of um, kind of death and rebirth cycle that is really much about Pluto, but Saturn is also about completion and basically the endings. And so we're in a massive transformation right now that's been activated and that we've been a part of. And then we've got, you know, the Uranus has been coming in this last year with a, what we call a Saturn Uranus square that added further influence and it activates upheaval in, a, in even more personal ways. Pluto is much more complex in a global way, but the, the Saturn Uranus has really forced um, a lot of us to undergo changes in how we meet our current day-to-day -day experience, bringing in insecurities in terms of financial, food insecurities, living situations, all of that. So it's, it's broad. Mm. So we have, uh, we have, Pluto, we have Saturn, we have Uranus, um, and we have both the global situation and then how each of us are, are navigating this time, depending on our individual astrologies, but also the, the collective uh, astrology. So how do you both think about leaving aside people's individual charts? Um, uh, where does the individual chart meet these broader collective themes of, you know, you've spoken of sort of what's happening in the wider world. And Ivana has talked about how we're meeting that, but coming back to you, Rachel, um, how, how should we who are quite naive about astrology understand the difference between our personal charts and the collective, uh, inner psychic weather mm -hmm. that we're facing as the outer psychic weather. As you say, the last time it was like this was the American Revolution, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean for our inner psychic weather and how we're, we're facing these events? Yeah, well, I think this, I'll, I'll respond to this in two different ways on uh, more on a philosophical le level and then get really practical about how to apply these to your everyday life. But, you know, um, a lot of ancient teaching uh, and that, you know, Michael, I was when I did my studies, I was trained in the Western esoteric tradition. So working with theosophical texts and and studying Alice Bailey and one of the the um, the concepts of that came that I that I sort of adopted from that study was that that we are all a part of this phenomena phenomenal entity this spiritual force that space itself is is alive and that we're all a part of this consciousness and so anything that's happening in the collective is also happening as a part of, of, of what's shifting within ourselves. And, and so when we look at, it's hard to separate the collective from the individual because, you know, as the, we're all one. Um, and so we are all a part of, of the shift that's happening and of these collective transits. And that's one thing I love about astrology is the way that that you can see in in a in a chart how you relate to the whole 
Hmm. We have now on a really practical level, we have personal planets from the moon, the sun, so the two luminaries up until Mars. And these are the planets that relate uh, archetypally to our everyday lives, to our physical bodies, our um, our emotions, our sense of self, our love, our money, all of those things. And then we have the social planets, which are Jupiter and Saturn. And I see these two planets as the bridge. You know, they are the beliefs and the ideas and all of that, those cultural constructs that are being formed, they are they are the ways that we interpret them and translate that we translate them into our everyday lives. And then we have the transpersonal planets from Uranus to Pluto. And these are representative of the bigger systems, the bigger thoughts, the, the higher, uh, the evolutionary processes of the world. And so when you're looking at how do I fit into these collective transits, what we want to look at is how are these outer planets, these transpersonal planets, forming relationships with your personal planets? Hmm. Because that shows us the way in which we can also look at those transpersonal planets are generational. So everybody within a 14-year period of time, born within a 14-year period of time, is going to have the same Neptune transit. And similar to, um, to Pluto, everyone within a seven year time is gonna have the same Uranus. So we can see the ways in which our generations affect consciousness and the ways our generations um, affect future generations. So it's really, it's really cool. Um, and you don't even have to know astrology or understand it to be a part of this, to feel it, to, you know, to, to participate in, in the shifts that are happening in our everyday lives. So the, are the personal planets, the ones that are closest in? Yes. And then the yeah. social, what did you call the second set, the social ones or what do you yeah, call the social, they're social planets. So that's Jupiter and Saturn. So personal, social, and then transpersonal. Yeah. Are the three. Yeah. Uh, realms of planets, each one for out. Uh, so I want to come back to that in a minute. But Yvonne, uh, what would you add to that? What would you uh, uh, bring us to, bring to us? You know, what I'm thinking about as I was listening to Rachel is how important it is to understand that those um, social planets that she labeled the Jupiter and Saturn also define our beliefs and, our, and how we apply those beliefs into structures and form. That's the Saturn part, structures and form. They are kind of a bridge from the personal into the transpersonal for each of us. And so in some ways where we might imagine that, the, that, that astrology sort of is like these things are happening to us, we do still have free will. And how we apply that is how we hold our beliefs and, and, and kind of hold a, a kind of uh, an attitude of care around those beliefs and how we apply those beliefs to the structures in our life and how we sort of set up the way we interact with the different people in our lives and the different um, emotions and our actions. And so I think it's an important factor to keep in mind that we do still have free will in the midst of this, these archetypal energies. You know, we, we, We'll still have these experiences, but it's how we respond to them and how we hold them within ourselves. And so that's a personal responsibility that's really held within both the personal planets, but particularly the social planets. And I think that's what we're looking at. It's fascinating about free will. You know, as you both know, there's a long historic debate about whether free will exists or not. And the great American psychologist William James once said that if free will exists, his first uh, decision is to believe in free will. <laughs> <laughs> the question of free will is a really interesting one, and it's debated on, on both sides. Uh, but uh, but I, I find it useful to believe in free will, and I'm so grateful you brought that up, because um, if we don't believe in free will... Um, if everything is determined, I mean, that's, you know, sort of predestination. That's kind of a misreading of Calvinism, isn't it? Predestination. Mm -hmm. 
probably not an actual uh, one, but uh, thank you for bringing that up. So I, I just want to cement that in my own mind. We have the personal planets, we have the social planets, we have the transpersonal planets. Uh, and as you importantly point out, Yvonne, it's not just happening to us, it's our capacity to decide how uh, we will work with these different uh, influences. Yeah. So, uh, Rachel, coming back to you, you talked about the um, the seven and 14 year uh, things and how each 14 year generation has its own aspect, its own uh, uh, way of relating to things. So if you take your generation, uh, what what are the energies that your generation is working with? as you face the world that um, you are inheriting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So when I look at generations, I look at Pluto. And uh, so Pluto stays in one sign from between four, from 14 to, to 30 years, depending on what sign and, and its orbit. And so my generation, I'm giving my age away now, is the Pluto and Libra generation. And themes of Libra have to do with balance and relationships, justice, harmony. They have to do with actually marriage and how we navigate autonomy and relation and relationships and in our lives. And if you think about my generation, a lot of us, you know, were, you know, that, that phrase latchkey kids, that was a phrase that came about when we were coming of age. So this idea that, you know, we were watching our parents' uh, generation um, going through divorce, having, going through marital counseling, you know, there, there, was, there was a lot of emphasis on, on building more secure relationships. And, um, and then also, I think that translates into uh, what we were watching on, on in, in the media, because Pluto does relate to mass media. So I think of my generation as the generation that's trying to balance opposition, that's trying to uh, integrate polarity, and also that's trying to uh, uh, create and, and, and establish a new sense of justice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Yvonne, I know that you and Rachel uh, work together on relationships in uh, astrology and so forth. Tell us about the work that you do in relationship to relationships within relationships and astrology it kind of fills a lot of different places for me because i work with it both in a psychological context but also in teaching with rachel and our group in relationships and astrology it's really to look to develop a greater sense of consciousness around how we are in relationships and how we bring our own unconscious material into relationships and how we can kind of discern that through the astrological chart where we might be actually activating something within ourselves in our relationship when we think it's really other and that's a really important key for us to for our own self-development to own our own shadow which is what that is projecting mm -hmm. that out so that's one of the ways i think about that and when you do this work, I mean, are you, you are, are you working in a group? How does it work? Well, when I work individually, we're going to be working in terms of what the patient or client brings in, in terms of what they're dealing with. And then we explore what part are they playing in that experience that they might not realize, particularly but, if it's a repetitive experience. Did I understand that you co-teach together? There's some process maybe i've got this wrong that you work together in this area well we each teach in the program in, but we teach individually i see oh. yeah. so, so there so there's a there's a, we are uh the core faculty of a relationships and astrology school <laughs> and so we um we work with two other astrologers kay taylor and margaret gray who are phenomenal astrologers yeah. and we, the group, we just love, we love our work together. And so we teach every aspect 
of, of relationships in astrology from compatibility to, you know, timing relationship decisions and, and navigating the, the, the aspects of ourselves that get triggered in relationships. And so we were part of this, this team. And at the same time, we both individually do our own separate work with, with clients and, and patients and, um, and, and helping them with their relationships. Mm. You know, as you both know, I'm very involved with the study of Enneagram. And so I don't know astrology well, <clears throat> but in Enneagram, this uh, system of nine different personality types and three subtypes for each of them. So 27 different subtypes of uh, of personality. Uh, it is so helpful to me in understanding my own relationships. And I know enough astrology to have found that it's useful to me. It's genuinely useful to me to, to know the astrology of the people I care about or the people I encounter. So what comes to me about these different archetypal systems is that it's not that you have to believe in something. Uh, somebody said to me yesterday when I was talking about this conversation, she said, I wish I believed in astrology because that would help me. And I said to her, you don't have to believe in anything. You just have to be interested in the power of story in our lives. Uh, that these, whether it's Enneagram <clears throat> or astrology, the power of story, of taking whatever is happening to us and framing it in story and enabling us to look at it in terms of these immensely powerful stories is itself healing, is itself therapeutic. And Yvonne, I want to go back to you because as a Jungian analyst, Jung gave us these incredibly powerful stories, but Jung himself deeply saw himself in a immense tradition that, you know, went back to Goethe and went back to the Egyptians and uh, went back to the Greek gods and everything else. It, it, Jung wasn't about, I mean, Jung was very interested in astrology, but his field of reference was immensely richer than astrology. Uh, and it was uh, about, you know, what Joseph Campbell worked with, just the power of myth, of fairy tales, uh, of these stories that human beings have been telling each other since the very beginning of time. So why should we privilege astrology over all the other forms of storytelling that as a Jungian analyst, you find powerful? I mean, why, why give a special place to astrology? What is it about astrology that causes you to privilege it above all the other forms of archetypal storytelling that Carl Jung and, and countless others have worked with? That's a really good question. I think that, you know, what you're you're talking to is that is that all of these different means that Jung was very involved with all carry archetypal meaning. That, that is that is the kind of uh, common platform that they all rest upon. And what he found when he began working with astrology was that it was a language of archetypal meaning. It wasn't itself the story. It was the describer, the words in some ways. We use the planets to kind of represent archetypal form. And that's, that's where it holds a value. It itself is not the story. We create the story. Well, that's beautiful because what you're saying is, is, is very much the way I hold it, that Jung found in astrology a language for archetypal meaning. But it was far from the only language, right? He was familiar with many other languages. So that brings me back to you. Um, why for you, of all the archetypal systems available to you as a Jungian analyst, 
does astrology have this signal power uh, mm. that, that causes you to privilege it above other systems? Well, I, I was introduced to astrology very young. I was 14 years old when I had my first astrology reading, and it helped me understand a lot about myself at that time, uh, defining the experience of being 14, which is a pretty, you know, bewildering experience for many of us as we enter into the pre-adult state. Mm -hmm. And so it, it kind of became a background language to discern my path, but I wouldn't say it was the only one. You know, for me, I work very much in a uh, story-oriented form as I listen to my patients. I'm not just looking at their chart. I listen to what they bring in. And it, it might be their past. It might be a dream. It might be a particular family narrative that we need to understand. All of that is story. And then I understand the archetypal. And then once in a while, I'll look at the chart of that person. And it's very remarkable to see the, the uh, mirroring reflection archetypally in the chart that what I've been hearing in the session. So it, it's all one in its own way. It creates a, a kind of continuity. Mm -hmm. And when you said you worked with other forms other than astrology, are there any you would uh, point to as particularly influential to you? Um, the dream work is very influential for me. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very, you know, it, it transcends so much of our conscious nature. It brings in other depths of meaning. Um, numinous experiences come in the dream form that are very hard to explain, and I find them very powerful. And in the dream work, do you focus, I mean, James Hillman, you know, perhaps Jung's greatest student, uh, was very opposed to interpreting dreams. He just suggested being with them through the day. Um, and of course, others interpret them quite rapidly. Where do you stand on the question of simply being with the power of the dream as opposed to interpreting it? That again, for me, is going to be um, mostly oriented toward the moment or in the patient. You know, some people will bring in a dream that is so articulated that it's obvious that it's a direct comment to a, a current situation. Other dreams carry a bigger meaning that we will spend our lifetime unfolding, mm -hmm. peeling back the layers. New meaning comes in decades later. Mm -hmm. And so I think you have to be reverent to what's being brought in by the unconscious because we never know what's being intended. We have to kind of hold some awe and respect for it, and let it basically explain itself. Mm. Rachel, you also came to astrology very young. Yvonne said at 14, how old were you when astrology entered your life? I was 14 as well. <laughs> <laughs> have you talked about that between you, that you both came to it at 14? You know, I think we have at, at one point at, at a different yeah. conversation. Yeah. And, and in astrological terms, is there something about 14 that is particularly significant as when astrology enters lives? Yes. So, so yeah. So what, so we talked about Saturn um, being structure, being the, the stable systems in our lives. And, um, and, and ultimately I think when we're talking about those systems, we're talking about the foundation of the ego mm -hmm. and at every seven and a half years, Sat transiting Saturn applies a hard aspect to your natal Saturn. And so, you know, seven and a half is that first time when you start really developing a sense of identity, um, understanding your talents and skills in relation to everyone, uh, everyone in, in your grade or uh, on the same level. And around four, between 14 and 15, we have the Saturn opposition. And that's really when, I mean, I, I see Saturn as the planet of karma, as the planet, it's the planet that represents what we do, the work that we do. And I think that's work sometimes in a professional way, but it's also the hard work of our lives. 
And definitely at 14, I was doing the hard work of my life, navigating, you know, a sense of self and, and, you know, I, 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 I uh, didn't get the lead in the play and I, you know, was sure as, so, so all of these things were happening at that time. And I discovered astrology just really by accident. And, and then I, I was able to, uh, to see how I was able to see myself in a new way, in a way that I could really, um, that I could deepen a sense of self-acceptance for some of the challenges and some of the aspects in my chart that, that I was really struggling with. And then also being able to see how I related to other people in my family. Um, that was, it was life-changing. It gave me a real sense of compassion for why my mother was the way she was. You know, my mother's wonderful, but you know, I but I could see there are our challenges right there in that symbolic language. Mm. Um we talked about this uh, earlier in a conversation among us, but well, first of all, when you speak of 14 as the age when Saturn is in opposition and one thinks of the oppositional situation of teenagers, right? You know? Yes. Uh, but yeah. we all, I think went beyond that to uh, think about the relationship of these um, uh, Saturn, but perhaps other uh, planetary uh, relationships to developmental phases and developmental psychology. So my question is, have either or both of you tried to chart uh, the developmental phases and astrological life cycles against the developmental stages in psychological systems? Like we just the first seven years, obviously, is an example. The second seven years to 14, the third seven years to 21, the fourth to 28, 35, 42. I mean, intuitively, that sounds a lot like a psychological development chart. It sounds like Eric Erickson. It sounds like other right. developmental psychologists. Has work been done charting the developmental phases of astrology in relationship, uh, I'll start with you, Yvonne, to uh, developmental stages in psychology? You know, I don't know that that I've seen that particularly. I've used it in my lectures in helping describe the process of becoming a person because the astrology, as it moves through its cycles, will set, definitely set it out. For example, you know, when you have your Mars return, that happens at age two. Well, we all know what happens. That's the terrible twos, right? The word no is really asserted. Agency is asserted that Mars has moved around that chart for a, a little person at age two and touched every single planet and given it agency and form and force. And so, you know, there's a way in which we understand that these cycles of the planets basically uh, manifest the individual over this over the time that they move through the chart. And so I don't know. I think developmentally, you know, Saturn is one of the easiest ones to look at because it is so much a structure of life. And we move from zero to say seven years old and we begin our experience of school and mastery, a sense of like Eric Erickson's psychosocial stages of development, where it's, it's um, industry versus isolation is the first phase. And then we move into the 14 year cycle and we're dealing or the 14 years of age where the Saturn opposition occurs and we're working with relationships and loneliness versus, you know, intimacy comes in. And then he has a broader phase at that point. But each of these, you know, in my mind with Saturn, it's it's the manifestation of the of spirit into form throughout that cycle. And, and it continues throughout our life. We're continually bringing ourselves into this world. So that's fascinating. So um, uh, does Mars go around every two years in general? Yeah. See, I, I don't know this stuff well. So Saturn goes every seven years. Mars goes every two years. How often does Venus go around? Oh, maybe Rachel can hop on that one. Okay. <laughs> about, about every year. And uh, same with Mercury. They both follow pretty close to the sun. 
And then we get, then, then the cycles of the outer planets are interesting because they're longer. So Jupiter is every 12 years. And a Jupiter cycle is very often, you know, when, when Jupiter returns back to the same place it was at the time of your birth, it starts out a whole new cycle of faith and belief and understanding and possibility. And a lot of people make career changes during a Jupiter cycle or make moves or do something big. They, you know, have the courage to go out wide. Um, and then, and then Uranus uh, Saturn is a is a takes 29 years to go all around the zodiac. So right before our 30th birthday and right before our 60th birthday, we have our Saturn return, and those are big moments where we, you know, I, I like to think of it as we are taking the reins of our life and going in a new direction, mm-hmm. and um, and and moving sometimes away from the beliefs and rules of the family and coming into our own, Um, then the Uranus cycle is 84 years. And so a lot of my clients in their 80s, you know, they're like, they have this whole new surge of life at 84. And Uranus is the planet, you know, it's kind of the disruptor rebel planet. And we have our Uranus opposition between 42 and 44, usually around 42, 43. And that's often a time when we want to rebel against the structures, the Saturn structures that we've built. And so you see a lot of people going through um, the midlife crisis is what what we call it, um, it, in an attempt to break free, to to reinforce a sense of, of freedom within the self. Um, and often that means freedom from our own self-imposed limitations. And then, you know, Pluto is a 240 year cycle, 48, Neptune's 165 years. So these are a little bit further, but the ones that we can track to psychological development and, and, and our personhood are, the, are, are those, um, you know, the ones that move a little bit faster. Mm. So this is really fascinating to me. It's, it's fascinating to talk with both of you at the same time, because Rachel and I, I've done this incredible spiritual biography with Rachel, which people can find on the New School. It's really extraordinary. And then we've done other conversations together. And so it's a evolving partnership that is teaching me a great deal. But speaking with both of you, it's very rich because um, what I'm coming to understand is each of the planets that can be contained within a lifetime is coming back around, you know, uh, at one level, probably the longest is 84 years. Um, And each one brings with it both in the full cycle, but also in the uh, at the halfway point, right? The oppositional point. Um, Its own energies. Or if we don't want to speak of energies, we can say its own story, its own interpretative story, right? We don't have to believe in anything here. In other words, all we need to to do to appreciate this is to be interested in story, right? There's, There's no other required belief. Now, it's interesting, it brings it alive to speak of the energies of the planet, of its influence, of things like that. But we don't need to believe in energies or influence to be interested in the story. That's, you know, sort of the the ground of it. So unlike other developmental psychologies, Erickson, Piaget, Kohlberg, others, um, you know, Erickson, psychosocial, Piaget, cognitive, Kohlberg, moral development, but they have these neat little boxes, you know, eight boxes or something like that. But in astrology, you have all these different planets, right? And each one has a separate thing. And you can track not only each one, but of course, all the interactions with everything else, with your moon, with your sun, and so on. So it creates an immensely rich palette of interpretative stories, right? Mm -hmm. And then, in a way, if you wanted to explain 
why it's so powerful, it is that the astrologer who has this immense immersion in all these stories can listen to a client or look at what's happening in the world and they can pin it to something that's happening in the astrology when they may have 30 different 50 i don't know how many choices they have but they can pin it to this thing that feels immensely powerful when in fact they could pin it to something totally different isn't that fair isn't it fair to say that part of the power of astrology is your ability to pin an internal or external event to something that is happening astrologically when you might choose to pin it to something totally different, give it a completely different interpretation, and it might say something entirely different to you and the client. Mm -hmm. Yvonne, what do you think about? I'm thinking about, I'm trying to think of an example of what you're talking about. You know, I work with people who don't work with astrology in, in my, my clinical process, and I don't think astrologically, interestingly, it's almost like there's like a little bit of a block. But what happens is I um, experience in their narrative storylines that fit astrological themes, you know, constraint, restriction, uh, that would be a Saturn feeling, break down, break open, break ups. That's a Uranus piece. Those are going on in their chart if I was to look at it. So it's, I, I agree with you. And I also think that it's important not to get too stuck and fixed on astrology as the only story. It, 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 can, it can help us, but sometimes what's really limiting is not the astrology, it's our understanding of it. And that I think that comes true with um, pretty much anything that we get fixed on. Hmm. Well, thank you for that. That's that's useful. Uh, Rachel, let me bring that same question to you and restate it. Um, I would think, from my limited understanding of astrology, that at any... Okay, I sometimes I buy the Astrodance charts, you know, Maybe once every couple of years, I spend whatever it is, $120 or something to get Liz Green's interpretation of what's going on in my life, right? Mm -hmm. And so obviously that's computerized, right? Yeah. And so this Astrodance spits out for me this bound volume, or I can just get the online version that tells me all the things that are going on in my chart. Mm -hmm. And some of them feel immensely true and others feel completely irrelevant to me all right mm -hmm. now if as an astrologer you're talking to a client and they say something and you say well your moon is doing this your sun is doing this your planets are doing this it seems to me you're selecting for relevance one piece of a very complex picture, other pieces of which, if you were to reference them, would not seem relevant to the client or would not seem relevant to you. So it seems to me that part of the art is the selection of which pieces of the astrological frame you, you go to. And that seems to me deeply related for both of you uh, for Ivana as a therapist, for you as an intuitive, uh, to what is most helpful, but you could choose a whole bunch of other things. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you know, as you're, as you're posing the question in a new way, there are two, two concepts that I think we might want to put into this conversation. And the first one is that that a lot of the cycles that we're talking about, squares, oppositions, you know, all the different ways that planets can relate to one another, there, you know, this is all based um, in sort of a classical understanding or Hellenistic understanding of the sacredness of math that uh, and principles of harmonics. So the principles of harmonics that underlie music, that, you know, that underlie the sacred geometry, 
And so there are certain, um, certain aspect relationships, certain geometric configurations that, uh, that show harmony. Things are open. There's a nice passageway. Uh, look at things. There's an, and the energies are open. And there are other ones where you can see discord. And often those transits that we go through, the oppositions, the squares, the conjunctions, where there's discord, we feel them stronger. And when we're talking about, and then there are others that are more spiritual, the quintile, the septile, there are are others that we don't, we, we can't really, um, you know, put into words in a real tangible way because we're experiencing things beneath the surface. And so when you look at uh, someone's astrology and you see those transits that are taking place, the one the client is going to be aware of the most is going to be the hard one, the stuff that's not that, like the challenges, the, and those are the growth edges. So, so, so that's one aspect of, I think, this conversation. The other aspect, I think, is talking about, I mean, all of this falls under the, under the category of synchronicity. Mm -hmm. And where do we find meaning? If we believe that the world, that, that the, the universe that we live in is the spiritual inter entity, that we are in a collective reality, then then meaning comes to us. We can we can think about the enneagram. We can think about all of these arch archetypal um, symbols. That that if the universe is if we're we're all one with it, then meaning is going to come into our lives in whatever way it needs to through our dreams, through astrology, through any through a conversation. Um, and I think astrology is you know, a pretty patterned and ordered way of, of gaining meaning in this synchronistic um, collective, in this synchronistic whole. Mm. Thank you both for that. What I'm coming back to, and I've said this to you before, Rachel, and to both of you in a previous conversation, I personally am profoundly engaged by for 50 years of my 78 years on this planet at least actually for more than 50 in fact for 60 years of my 78 years i've been interested in archetypal systems that you know like you you both were introduced at 14 and I'm counting from 18, but I might be able to count from 14. I think I began to read Freud at 14 about, you know. Yeah. Um, so maybe there's something about 14 or so that we begin to ask, what are the systems that we're going to understand the world in? You know, my mother was a psychologist. She was a neo-Freudian my father was a political philosopher. So psychology and politics have been the two poles of my entire life, you know, mm -hmm. and um, we are healing ourselves and healing the earth. Uh, and so I've wrestled with these two poles of meaning. And what I've said to Rachel before, when we've talked about the power of astrology, I've said, how can we privilege Western astrology over Vedic astrology, for example, it's equally powerful. You know, I have a beloved friend who's a Vedic astrologer. She's given me readings. They're wonderful, right? Or how can we uh, privilege it over, you know, the Chinese zodiac? Or, you know, how can we privilege it? The Greeks, when they had problems, they wanted to know which of the gods to worship, you know, which of the gods they should, you know. And so... Um, there are all these archetypal systems. And then specifically, I think, in addition to astrology and Enneagram, I think of the I Ching and I think of the Tarot, right? Uh, and, um, you know, the, the I Ching has immense power and that's pure synchronicity or pure chance. It's not linked to your birth date. It's not linked to your character structure in Enneagram. You throw the coins, you know? Uh, um, and then the tarot, I've just begun to immerse myself in the tarot 
which some people trace back to Kabbalah. And um, again, an immensely powerful system. So when I, so what really fascinates me is, is the simple power of these archetypal stories to deepen our awareness of our lives and the world around us without privileging any one of them unduly. Mm -hmm. But when we're engaged with one, as you are both engaged with uh, Western astrology, then it takes on this and needs to take on this incredibly powerful life of its own that goes beyond a, a story and becomes uh, influences and energies and things like that that are in some sense incarnated in the stories as opposed to simply being stories. Now, Yvonne, let me go to you with that set of observations. Where, where do you go with that? So let me just understand. You're saying that they influence maybe more powerfully by the way we hold the astrology. Is that what you're kind of referencing? I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting only for myself, not for you. Uh, I'm, I'm gently challenging you both. <laughs> That's my way of doing dialogue. I, I am gentle, but I challenge. Um, I am gently challenging you both to at once hold the uh, power of believing that Western astrology, as you practice it, actually involves energies and influences that are palpable in the real world. But then how does one hold that when there are all these other systems, including Vedic astrology, which is right. such a cousin, which see things differently, yeah. and yet they have the same power? Yeah. And so how do you, Yvonne, hold both your immersion in Western astrology, which has been so powerful from, for you from age 14 onward, as more than simply a set of stories, as a set of influences and energies, and at the same time see it, as Jung saw it, against the background of all the other powerful stories. How do you hold those two things? Right. Well, it, it, it's like allowing for many different possibilities to exist simultaneously, which is not always the, the human experience you know, um, effort is not always dealt with that very well. And I think from, from my perspective as a, a clinician, you know, I work with different people, they bring in different experiences, but they have reflections of similarity at the same points of life, you know, like we're talking about age 21, age, you know, 30, and so forth. We know that there are cycles of development going on, but what happens in those periods is significantly different based on the individual. To me, you know, having, I respect uh, all the different disciplines that you're talking about because they provide a different lens of, of how to understand energy mm -hmm. in my mind. And that's, that's sort of being open to that, you know, allowing different um, symbol systems to provide new information, new experience of meaning. And I, I feel like I'm constantly learning astrology. I don't think I figured it all out at this age of 60, almost 64. It's still an evolving, you know, art. And I think that's the way to think about it, at least for me, is that this is an art form. So it's under, it's going to transform. So I like that very much. I mean, I really resonate to what you just said, that, that you are able, in addition to your immersion, in Western astrology and in Jungian therapy, you are able to hold all these different symbol systems as different lenses on which to look at these energies. That's what I do. In other words, now I'm, I feel like we've really connected at that level of this, this conversation. Yeah. And Rachel, you and I have talked about these things, but how do you hold these questions? Yeah. Well, I think um, I, I think that that we're always learning new things, and the field of quantum physics actually 
has a lot of, um, and I'm, I'm not a physicist and I don't, I, I, I won't go into any of the theories because <laughs> I, I don't, this is not my area of expertise, but one of the things that I've been really exploring lately is the nature of light. And so when we're looking at, when we're looking at planets, when we're looking at stars, when we're looking at the sun and other galaxies, we're looking at light and light has an energetic frequency and even a color um, that we can feel and access with our physical senses. So whether you're looking at Vedic astrology, Chinese astrology, or in Mayan astrology, those are all a study of, of, of myth, um, of archetypes, and of light. And a lot of the same principles are cross-cultural. A lot of the same archetypal images translate into different cultures without even, you know, like this, this dates back to the ancient Babylonian and Mesopotamian times. Um, and so, so we have similar themes that repeat themselves. And I, I think that I love what Yvonne said about how there are entire spectrums of possibilities. So quantum, quantum physics teaches us that all of, these, all of these possibilities exists at any one second, and it's our perception that assigns meaning. And so I think, um, I think that there's like a crossover between these different systems and the ultimately the crossover is our own experience and how we receive the energies that are that are coming that are coming that are that are changing and evolving and shifting as we are. Mm. I'm so glad you you raised quantum physics and 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 also more broadly cosmology. Um, I have long been fascinated by something called the anthropic principle. Not sure if you've heard of it, but the anthropic principle, if you look it up in Wikipedia, is the observation that the universe seems perfectly designed to create life. And there's a weak anthropic principle and a strong anthropic principle. And actually, I just commissioned a colleague to do a, a deeper study of the anthropic principle because it seems so important to me that the observable universe seems perfectly designed. If it were even a minute hair off, it wouldn't support life. So how can we understand that the observable universe seems designed to support life? Well, that has driven physicists like Stephen Hawking's completely crazy. And what they did was to say, you know, that can't be true. And so the only way we can understand it is the multiverse to say, actually, there are millions or billions of universes, and most of them don't support life. And we happen to be in the one that does support life. But if you think about and they have no shred of evidence that that's the case, that's a whole theory. And the only universe we can actually see is support designed to support life, you know, so. On the one hand, the multiverse, you know, it has its many supporters. But on the other hand, what does it say about the only universe that we can see is that its laws and principles must in some form be based on some form of cosmic love, because love is what creates or life. You know, I mean, you can understand love however you want to speak of it. And so cosmology and and uh, quantum physics are filled with things, uh, you know, light. It can be either an energy or a particle. And quarks can influence events on the other side of the universe. And so the mystery of the universe in, in purely scientific form is immense. Mm -hmm. and, and so the question of how the mysteries, that's why I so respect people who have no interest in spirituality or mysticism or any of those things, but an immense interest in the mysticism of, of the, the whole creation, you know. So mm -hmm. I want to, uh, well, two things. First of all, if people have questions, please put them in the chat and we will try to get to them. But 
we're having such a good time that we have plenty to uh, talk about, um, uh, but we welcome your, your questions. But before this conversation, we had planned to use our conversation about Saturn as a bridge uh, to talking about this Aquarian age that we're entering. So, Rachel, I wonder if you could start us on that. Um, uh, how is Saturn a bridge to the Aquarian age? What is the Aquarian age? What, what do we understand about it? Yeah, so um, so let's define the Aquarian age first. Um, and and really, when we're talking about age, about um, ages, period, big periods of time, we're talking about the precession of the equinox. So there's a sidereal interpretation of the age of Aquarius, and there's a more um, spiritual, uh, psychological version of the age of Aquarius. And so what? What I'm going to be talking about is more of that because there's a there are some disagreements and and about when the actual age of Aquarius begins, but we can look at each age um, uh, as defined by uh, that particular sign. And so themes that come up during the sign of Aquari during the age of Aquarius. You know, I think if anybody's seen Hair, um, you you know, or listened to that that song by the Fifth Dimension, some of those themes, you know, of 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 collectivism, of um, of of seeing ourselves as one. The the symbol for Aquarius is the water bearer, and this is a symbol of you know the water, the the rivers and what bodies of water were places where people gathered. Where uh, where trade was was happening, but that symbol of water ultimately represents the the whole of humanity, the oneness that we are, and like each individual drops within one great big ocean, one body the, the of the human race, and and I would actually include one body of the world of the universe, um, not to be species specific. And when we're talking about Aquarius, we're talking about um, a contrast between individuality and who I, who I am, the, my gifts and my unique contribution within the whole. And so the Aquarian age represents both of these themes, both radical individualism, freedom, individual freedom, and collectivism. And so Saturn is in the sign of Aquarius right now, and it has been since late 2020. And Pluto is getting ready to enter Aquarius next year. And Pluto, is, Pluto's, a, you know, stays in Aquarius for a, a long time. And so when Pluto is in a sign, it is making themes represented by that sign well known. And so we're moving more into the Aquarian ideals. Saturn in Aquarius has been and usually is a time when we're finding ways to connect through technological innovation. The first last time we had this in the 90s, we were getting the internet and email in our homes with AOL and chat rooms. This time we have Zoom. There are also uh, there's always been um, as well a real focus on environmental concerns and on the earth and finding ways to use technology to help um, address some of those concerns and humanitarianism. So there's a lot of that that we're already seeing, and we're going to see even more of it when Pluto enters Aquarius next year. How, how long does the age of Aquarius last? Well, the uh, again, this is uh, debatable because of the procession of the equinoxes, but a couple of a, a couple thousand years. So, um, and no trivial thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And what they also, you know, there's there's usually every age has its ascended master. So the age of Pisces, which is what we have been in was marked by Jesus. The sign of Jesus was the fish mm -hmm. and Christianity. So that has been one of the big focal points um, in terms of our spiritual ideas and, and beliefs. And, um, and so, you know, so Christianity has been tied to the age of Aquarius. 
and before that there was the 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 cow god the age of of taurus um there we can go back and look at all of the different ages and see the different deities that were associated with those ages yeah, but the pisces was the the age of of the of the fish of the christ mm -hmm. uh, so is the ascendant master of the age of aquarius does that equate to the water bearer or does the ascendant mass as the ascendant master in some other form emerged or is intended to emerge i i personally feel that that the ascended master of this time is finding the divine within ourselves mm. and realizing that we have a responsibility if we are embodying the divine if we are if we are the divine here manifest on earth then what is our responsibility to take care of one another to take care of the earth mm -hmm. um and we see a lot of people right now you know with youtube with tiktok with there are a lot of people coming into their own spiritually and becoming you know gurus um uh having a platform for for teaching spiritual concepts so i don't we don't we won't know for a little while um who that you know what that what that deity is or what the sim symbol for the age of aquarius is but looking at the symbolism of aquarius it really is about the collective whole Mm -hmm. So I think that's where we're moving is more away from having one sort of icon or image for the divine and an understanding that we're all divine here in one collective. And isn't justice in some way a core theme of Aquarius? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, I think it, it has to do with absolutely justices because when we're talking about the sign of Aquarius, we're talking about, about co the collective and understanding that if anyone is, if, if you know, that, that, that what is happening to the, um, to those with the least socioeconomic power affects the whole. Um, and I know I have a little bit of an idyllic um, perspective on this or utopian um, concept. I understand that I'm, I tend to be more of an optimist astrologer, but I, I, I think that there's going to be a real opportunity for us throughout the next 20 years to, um, to balance a lot of the inequality that we have. And we saw that with Pluto in Aquarius the last time, you know, as Pluto was entering Aquarius in the 1700s, 1776 to 1778, we saw an attempt at breaking free from, from uh, the monarchy at, at you know, at um, colonized countries, um, finding, like creating revolution to, to create their own democracies, their own systems. And so we can look backwards and say what was happening then. And similar themes apply, but on a whole new level. And that's beautiful. Yvonne, as you reflect uh, on this really monumental event, right, for the next several thousand years, <laughs> a movement into the age of Aquarius, what does it mean to you? And if you know, what did it mean to Carl Jung? You know, I don't know Jung's perspective on that so much. Um, that's that's an interesting one. I haven't looked at what he he discussed around the ages of of that particular archetype. Mm -hmm. You know, in my perspective, I, I would agree with Rachel on on many levels. I have probably a feeling though that the the work toward getting there will be working through a kind of tension of opposites, which is very union in its own form that we are kind of encountering right now with in terms of this humanitarian perspective versus the me perspective, the, the kind of survivalist perspective. And we're kind of working through, I think, um, the collective dynamic of opposition 
as we move out of this one form of consciousness into a new form of consciousness. And this will take some time. As, as Rachel said, we've got a couple thousand years to get there. So <laughs> what we can do is all hold, you know, a more humanitarian perspective and hope to seed that future, in my view. As we enter the last period of this conversation, let me start with you, Yvonne. Um, what have we not addressed yet that you would like to bring forward uh, that you would hope would be part of the record of our conversation? Mm. Well, I think I was just talking about it a little bit. We are in a tension of opposites, as we can see, not just in our own country, but on the world global level. We're dealing with, um, you know, assertions of power, assertions of, of who holds the truth. And we're having to kind of manage our hope for the future against the backdrop of what we're kind of really seeing. There's a disparity of, of care for much of the population. You know, when you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the basic ones of food and shelter, these are very, you know, challenging qualities for a large portion of the population. And so this humanitarian uh, perspective that we're seeking to grow into we have to hold those of us that can hold it because we we are we're holding that potentiality, the seed that will hopefully be planted and flourish. Mm. So from my point of view, we're, we're kind of having to hold the tension of opposites at this point and be very awake to that. You know, Carl Jung is such an important figure to me. I, I have a library up here on Whitby and a library in Bolinas, and I don't have a lot of repeats of books, but up here and in Bolinos, I have Jung's collected works and his red book. Mm. I mentioned to you before, if people look at the new school, uh, I've, I've done quite a few conversations on Jung and a lot of conversations on James Hillman and archetypal psychology more broadly, of which these conversations on astrology are for me very much a part. And, you know, I have some very, uh, you know, decided uh, views about Jung. I regard Jung as a greater figure than Freud, which is heretical to a lot of people. But I regard Jung as a greater figure than Freud. And um, I, I think that, um, you know, Jung got seriously dinged and legitimately so for his flirtation with Nazism, you know, during the Nazi period, uh, when the Nazis were trying to write Freud out of the record, uh, because he was Jewish, they seized on Jung as a way into depth psychology, and he flirted with it. And then he got seriously burned for that. And even to this day in Germany, there are very few people who are willing to say they are influenced by Jung. I mean, I went to Berlin and met one of the few Jungian analysts there. Um, but that's just the way history works. You know, I mean, these great thinkers, whether it's Wagner or Jung or, you know, you know, people's politics get them in trouble. But then over time, as their politics recede, their true importance comes out. And for me, part of the importance of Jung is that he represented not only himself, but he was a synthesizer of this vast amount of work that preceded him in mythology and philosophy, uh, in medicine, and so on and so forth. He, he actually believed uh, there was a family joke that he was descended from Goethe, that his grandmother had had an affair with Goethe, you know. But he, and so to me, what he did, Jung was kind of a time capsule that brought this immensely powerful European tradition of the European Enlightenment and everything else through the, you know, immense impoverishment of thought that has taken place in the modern period and deposited this time capsule into the Aquarian age, right, into the beginning of the Aquarian age. And so if you unpack Jung, not only for what he represents, but for all that his predecessors represent, I see him as a kind of a conduit mm -hmm. uh, for the immense power 
of depth psychology at a time when everything is reduced to, you know, materialism and behavioral psychology and everything else. So to me, you and the Jung Institute are working and in, in preserving this immensely powerful system. And, and for me to meet you as Rachel's friend, who is both an astrologer and on faculty at the Jung Institute, I'm, I'm just honored by that. I want to yeah. say. Thank you. Honored to be with you, Michael. Well, it's a real pleasure. Mm-hmm. And as for my friend, Rachel Lang, who <laughs> used me and, and who's um, uh, spiritual biography and our previous conversations are so rich. Um, you know, Rachel, um, it brings tears to my eyes. You know, I, I sent you a note that um, I don't understand the connection between us. I don't seek to understand it, but it's very powerful to me. Uh, and it, um, I, 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 am, I am learning from you. Uh, and this, um, this inquiry into astrology with both of you and, and Yvonne next time with your husband, Richard Tarnas, who will join us, author of Cosmos and Psyche and, and uh, a full partner with you in this astrological work. I'm so glad you're married. I, I <laughs> so are we. <laughs> how, how rich that is between the two of us. But, um, I'm just so grateful for these conversations because what they do for me is to affirm the power of archetypal story in our lives and the mystery of it. The mystery. You know. Uh, So, Rachel, last thoughts and reflections. Mm, Well, uh, Michael, you know, I feel the same way about our connection and about you and um and yeah it's deep so thank you for for inviting us to be here for inviting me to be here and for inviting me to invite Yvonne um and Yvonne you know I I love you you've taught me so much about relationships actually just in like co-teaching with you and also about even you've deepened my own knowledge about um about archetypes about young about all of these um depth psychology about all of these things so uh so yeah so i'm i'm very 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 grateful thank you so much rachel Mm -hmm. wonderful so with that um let me just reflect on a last thought for me i'm looking at the clouds outside my window at the snow-capped Cascade Mountains, uh, Mm -hmm. other side of the Saratoga Passage that I can see from my front window up in Whidbey Inn. Just to my left, Jung's collected work and the Red Book um, here. Those (laughs) who haven't seen the Red Book. (laughs) There it is. Um, um, I actually did a conversation on the Red Book. Um, you know, this was kept secret, as as Yvonne knows, for a long time. And it was actually only uh, Sonu Shamdasani who actually talked the, convers- the family into allowing it to be published. And to me, I would say it's Jung's greatest work. You know, it's just so powerful it's so visually powerful um so what an homage i just want to close with an homage to this this great figure carl jung right astrologer um one of the greatest of all the modern psychologists you know um and just gratitude that uh he has so enriched the lives of so many millions of people and enriched our lives as well. So thank you both. And Kira, I will turn it back over to you. What a great conversation. It's wonderful to have both of you here with us and thank you for your time. I know we're both very busy. So just a reminder that we will have the recordings from this conversation posted on our website, tns.commonweal.org. 
and on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Rachel, Lang, Yvonne, Smith, Tarnas, and Michael, thank you for being with us at the New School of Commonweal. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. 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 Don't take it, don't, don't, don't.